Okay, folks. So this week, we are going to be talking uh, about the ethics of euthanasia. Uh, because we're dealing with questions of life and death, this can be a pretty heavy subject. Um, but I think it's also a very worthwhile subject to reflect on. Uh, partly because uh, we will all encounter uh, questions about life and death and end-of-life decision-making, whether with ourselves or with family members. Uh, but also that many of us uh, are going to go into the healthcare profession. Uh, and even if you yourself aren't going to go into the healthcare profession, uh, you'll probably know very many people um, who will. Uh, so these are important things uh, to reflect on, uh, and philosophy can help us here. Uh, so the plan is we're going to be looking at an essay by Leon Cass called Why Doctors Must Not Kill. Um, and then we're going to be taking uh, a look at the opposite view uh, from a philosopher named uh, Peter Singer uh, in the next video. Uh, so just before we get into the specifics of uh, Cass's view, um, we'll also just... Uh, sort of consider some general facts and uh, conceptual distinctions we might make about euthanasia. And then uh, we'll start thinking about Cass's own arguments. Uh, so here are some of the facts on the ground. Um, Physician-assisted dying is legal in nine US states. So we've got uh, the West Coast, uh, Montana, Colorado, and a few Eastern states and uh, DC. Uh, and uh, euthanasia has uh, basically uh, been uh, popularly supported for a long time. Uh, so it, since the 70s, a majority of Americans have thought uh, that euthanasia should be legal. In 2017, 73% of Americans uh, said that they were in favor of legalizing euthanasia. So... What are we talking about when we talk about euthanasia? Well, it's basically the practice of assisting in a patient's death, um, where the assistance is motivated by the hope of benefiting the patient. Uh, so the thought would be, if a patient's quality of life uh, gets so low that they think it would be better for them to be uh, dead than to uh, bear having a disease, uh, taking the means uh, to hasten that death, uh, that is to make it come sooner, uh, is considered euthanasia. Now, there's a few different versions of it. So we've got non-voluntary, involuntary, and voluntary. So voluntary euthanasia would be a case where a person uh, consciously asks a healthcare practitioner uh, to cause them to die. Um, Whereas, uh, with non-voluntary euthanasia, that's a person who is no longer competent uh, to make requests about their health care. Uh, so this can happen with people, for instance, who are in vegetative states. Uh, when you're in a vegetative state, uh, that means uh, your reflexes will continue to work, you will still be breathing, uh, uh, so digestion and reflexes and breathing, those things will still be functional. Uh, but as far as we know about patients in vegetative states, there's really no consciousness. So it's like, you know, being asleep without a dream for a very, very, very long time. Uh, now what happens in those cases is sometimes um, they have advanced directives. Uh, so in those cases, a person would give uh, proxy consent. Uh, so for instance, if your spouse uh, is um, the person that you assign uh, to be your decision maker, uh, they can uh, consent for you uh, to be euthanized uh, if you've requested that, and that's considered non-voluntary uh, euthanasia. It's euthanasia for a person who is no longer competent 
to request it for themselves. Now, that's different from involuntary euthanasia. So that would be a case where a person does not want euthanasia and makes that uh, request competently, uh, but they are euthanized anyway. So involuntary euthanasia, uh, most people are going to agree, is immoral. Uh, you might even think that even if a person is going to be better off dead, that their quality of life is so low, it would still be wrong uh, to bring about that person's death. So that's, that's our set of distinctions. Voluntary, competently asked for. Non-voluntary is euthanasia given to a person who is no longer competent uh, to make requests about their care on their own behalf. And involuntary is when someone is euthanized uh, against uh, their competent wishes. Uh, so that's one set of distinctions. We also have active versus passive euthanasia. So the difference here is pretty straightforward. Active euthanasia is where a particular drug or substance is given to a patient with the aim of killing that person. Uh, so for instance, uh, if um, a doctor gives a patient uh, barbiturates uh, to basically cause them to uh, overdose on those barbiturates, that would be considered active euthanasia. Whereas passive euthanasia is simply to withhold life-saving care. Uh, so, um, in the cases of withholding life-saving care, uh, that might be uh, foregoing, say, a certain kind of surgery, or foregoing uh, giving a patient uh, a certain kind of drug or treatment, knowing full well that by not getting that drug or treatment, that the patient uh, will end up dying, that nature will take its course in those cases. Um, one other distinction, there's a distinction to be made between euthanasia versus physician-assisted suicide. Uh, so the idea here is that if the medical professional is administering the lethal dose, uh, then it's euthanasia. But when a patient administers themselves uh, themselves a legal, lethal dose uh, that's prescribed by a doctor, that's physician-assisted suicide. So it's basically the difference here, whether, whether the patient themselves uh, is putting the drug into their own body by, say, uh, pushing the plunger on a syringe themselves, or by taking and swallowing the pills themselves, rather than having them, uh, say, injected by the physician. Uh, so just to go back to that map that we looked at a moment ago, um, these states where physician-assisted dying is legal, like California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, these are cases where it's physician-assisted suicide that is legal. Uh, so in these cases, the doctor can prescribe a lethal dose, and the patient can then go get that lethal dose, uh, but it's not actually legal for the doctor to administer uh, that drug himself. Now, some philosophers have argued that really there's no morally interesting difference, or not morally interesting, but there's no morally relevant difference uh, between euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, right? Um, both of them are bringing about uh, the patient's death. Um, it's just a matter of like who's pulling the plunger, pushing the plunger on the syringe. Uh, but in any case, uh, physician assisted suicide is legal in about nine states in the US, whereas full on active, euth active euthanasia where the physician is administering the lethal dose uh, is not legal anywhere in the US. In fact, passive euthanasia is legal uh, pretty much everywhere. There are cases where patients and doctors will mutually agree 
uh, to forego certain treatments uh, with the full understanding that that will bring about a patient's death. Okay, with all that in mind, uh, when we think about these arguments, we're mainly going to be thinking about active voluntary euthanasia. So we are trying to figure out the question of whether it would be a good thing to allow uh, doctors to administer lethal dose, doses to patients uh, when they ask for them. So that's not legal anywhere right now, uh, but from an ethical perspective, we can still ask the question, well, even though we're not doing it yet, uh, maybe, maybe we should change the law. Maybe it should be the case that a doctor uh, should be able to give a patient a lethal dose uh, when they ask for it in order to ease their pain, um, and that a doctor should not have to do that secretly, and that they should not be uh, sent to jail uh, for... Uh, bringing about uh, a terminally ill patient's death. So, uh, now that we understand some of these important distinctions, let's take a look at this argument from Leon Cass. The title of the essay is Why Doctors Must Not Kill. This is Leon Cass right here. Uh, so we know what the main thesis of this essay is. Let's fill this in a little bit more. So he's saying that uh, doctors must never, ever, ever be allowed to kill their patients, even if they request to be euthanized. And he doesn't tell us much about when it's okay for a doctor to let their patient die, but in terms of active euthanasia, he thinks that that should never be okay, even when it's fully voluntary and fully consented to. So his main argument is basically this. He says that permitting euthanasia, active euthanasia, would lead to a deterioration of the doctor-patient relationship, and it would undercut a doctor's ability to care for their patients. So we can start filling this in. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about the doctor-patient relationship, but the main idea is that a person uh, might not uh, relate to their doctor in the same way uh, when it's a live option for that doctor uh, to give a terminal patient a lethal dose. Uh, and there are also questions about a doctor's ability to care for a patient. So Cass points out that maybe an old person would be hesitant to go uh, to the emergency room if they knew that uh, doctors would maybe feel like the right thing to do would be to put this person out of their misery. Um, and maybe doctors might not try as hard in caring for their patients um, if they know that giving up on them uh, through euthanasia is a live option. So, moving forward. Uh, Cass also points out that a problem with active euthanasia is connected to the question of consent. So an important principle in contemporary medical ethics is that whenever possible, we want the fullest amount of consent uh, from patients for the procedures being given to them. Uh, but Cass points out that patients who are deeply suffering are unlikely to be in a good position to offer informed consent to end their life. So you have to be in a particular kind of situation in order to be asking to have your life ended. Uh, so you're going to have to be going through extremely painful treatments. Uh, and it seems like what Cass might be saying here is that these actions are not fully voluntary. Uh, if we want to think about the nature of voluntary actions, um, we can go all the way back to the Greeks, to Aristotle. Aristotle says that in order for an action to be voluntary, it has to be done with full knowledge of the consequences, but also um, 
without any duress. So what is duress? Well, it's basically like pressure to do something. So a really clear example of duress is uh, when a robber comes up to you, points a gun at you and says, uh, you know, your wallet or your life, right? In that case, you're giving him your wallet, uh, but you're not exactly doing it voluntarily, right? You're doing it out of fear and pressure. So if we take that thought, we might think, well, maybe asking to have your life ended is kind of like giving your wallet to the robber if the reason you're asking for it is a lot of pain and misery. Uh, so when you have pain and misery is the cause of your request, not fully voluntary. Uh, Cass also points out that he thinks that it's incoherent. It's just like a logical point that it's incoherent uh, to want to be benefited by being killed. It's completely irrational. It's like irrational uh, to want to give all your money away in order to become richer. And here's Cass's thought. He says that when you die, uh, you become nothing, right? Set aside religious questions for a moment. Uh, to want to die is to want to not exist. Uh, but if you don't exist, you cannot be benefited. So, you can never be benefited by having your death brought about. Uh, so it's completely incoherent, it's illogical, according to Cass, that a person can want to be killed in order to gain a benefit. That just doesn't make any sense. It's impossible. Uh, Cass also argues, so this is a separate point, that once we legalize euthanasia, it won't be confined to cases where the patient requests it. He says, what about people with severe cognitive disabilities? Uh, he says that there will probably be court rulings that make it such that uh, people with cognitive disabilities will be given an equal right to have their suffering ended as people who are fully able to speak. Uh, but moreover, we're gonna have uh, clever cases of manipulating proxy consent, right? So we talked about non-voluntary euthanasia, where you have, say, a spouse consent to a certain treatment uh, when you no longer have the capacity to. Well, we're going to get more and more cases of that. Now, in defense of that point, Cass notes that in a survey, 40% of physicians surveyed in Holland where euthanasia is legal, 40% of physicians have performed euthanasia without <clears throat> a patient's request. And 10% of those physicians, or 10% of physicians overall, have performed euthanasia without a patient's request five times or more. So you can raise a question whether these instances of euthanasia performed without a patient's request um, are ones where good procedures of proxy consent are being done, or whether these are more nefarious cases of doctors deciding unilaterally uh, to kill off what we might think of as inconvenient patients. Um, but what we'd have to do then is follow up Cass on his sources uh, and see if he's using them responsibly. We might also ask questions about whether this is merely anecdotal evidence. Uh, is this one case in Holland uh, representative of what euthanasia would be like as a whole if it were legalized, say, in Canada or America or Britain? Or is this um, maybe an outlier case? So that's something to think about. Here's yet another way of looking at it. And this is gonna come back to uh, this thought about the doctor-patient relationship uh, that Cass finds really important. He says that we can see some wisdom in the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, so the Hippocratic Oath uh, was a pledge developed by Hippocrates for new doctors. 
Uh, and doctors, in many cases, still say versions of the Hippocratic Oath today. But Cass is not just saying, well, it's in the Hippocratic Oath, so euthanasia can't happen. What he's really saying is that there's a certain kind of wisdom built into the Hippocratic Oath. It places some absolute limits on what a doctor is morally permitted to do. And basically, the idea is this. There are certain things, according to the Hippocratic Oath, that you must never do. So you must never breach a patient's confidentiality. You must never have sexual relationships with your patients. Um, and you must never provide drugs meant to end a patient's life. Uh, maybe you're allowed to prescribe a lethal drug, say like morphine, uh, but you should only do that uh, in order to ease the patient's pain, right? You, can, you should never intentionally bring about a death as a physician. And Cass says, within these limits, like, outside those extremes, there's a lot of uh, leeway. But he thinks that there's a good rationale for placing these limits. He points out that the doctor-patient relationship in many ways is asymmetrical, right? Uh, the patient tells the doctor intimate details of their life. The patient, but not the doctor, uh, exposes their naked body. Uh, and a patient, but not the doctor, uh, needs uh, to be healed. Uh, so the thought is that the Hippocratic Oath is supposed to put limits against certain uh, vulnerabilities that patients are open to. It would be a bad thing, for instance, if a doctor were to examine a patient uh, and their naked body, uh, and then the next day ask them out on a date. Uh, there seems to be something of a power imbalance there. So this oath is supposed to place limits on these uh, power imbalances. Moreover, Cass says that this prohibition on killing for doctors um, is absolute for a doctor because human life uh, commands a certain kind of respect and reverence. And within this context, uh, Cass suggests that doctors shouldn't be focused on killing patients. Rather, uh, patients who are terminal, they should focus on easing and enhancing the lives of the dying. Uh, so the thought would be, if doctors really did what their calling tells them to do, they would be, say for instance, uh, trying to improve quality of life. Uh, for even a patient with terminal cancer or dementia, uh, rather than say, throwing in the towel, giving up, and saying this is a hopeless case uh, and we need to let this patient die. Or, not even just let this patient die, but it is time to cause this patient to die. So let's look at a, a quote from Cass's essay. I think that by looking over this passage, we'll get an even deeper understanding of what he's getting at when he's talking about the importance of uh, preserving uh, the doctor-patient relationship by having a ban on euthanasia. So he says this, the central meaning of physicianship derives not from medicine's powers, but from its goal. Not from its means, but from its end. Okay, let's pause there. When we talk about the end of something, uh, that's another way of talking about the purpose of something. Uh, now this is an important ethical idea, right? Uh, Aristotle, for instance, uh, based his whole ethical theory on understanding what the purpose of things are. Uh, sometimes he would talk about these things as the end, uh, but the fancy Greek word for it was telos, right? So when you hear teleology or uh, teleological, it's basically thinking about uh, the purpose and function of things. So in this context, we talk about the end which is another fancy philosophical term for purpose. 
We're saying we have to think about what it is to be a physician by thinking about the purpose of being a physician. So what's that purpose? He says, to benefit the sick by the activity of healing. He goes on to say, the physician as physician serves only the sick. He does not serve the relatives or the hospital or the national debt inflated due to Medicare costs. Thus, he will never sacrifice the well-being of the sick to convenience or pocketbook to the convenience or pocketbook or feelings of the relatives or society. Moreover, the physician serves the sick not because they have rights or wants or claims, but because they are sick. The healer works with and for those who need to be healed in order to help make them whole. So the idea here is if we want to figure out what a physician should do, we need to figure out what the purpose of a doctor is. And he claims that the purpose of a doctor is to benefit pa patients when they are sick by healing them. So the thought then is that when a doctor um, does work that goes against this purpose of healing the sick, they're doing something wrong, right? They are running at cross purposes of what they are actually meant to do. Uh, so for instance, you know, if you tried to, oh, let's say, you know, use a steak knife to cut down a tree, that would be uh, getting the purpose of that thing wrong, right? Uh, and we might think that there are other cases where uh, there are versions of practicing medicine that don't have anything to do with healing the sick. So you might think about uh, a plastic surgeon who's not helping people live uh, healthier or more fulfilled lives uh, in terms of, you know, having a body that works and is able to, uh, you know, function as a body, but instead uh, is purely cosmetic, right? Uh, so hiring a physician uh, just to remove some wrinkles from my forehead. Uh, we might think that that's in a certain way perverse, uh, not perverse in a gross sexual way, but we might think just uh, a perversion of the main function of medicine, right? If I'm getting plastic surgery just to remove some wrinkles from my forehead, I'm using this doctor uh, for something other than their real purpose of healing the sick. So if you're on board with that thought, you might get on board with this further thought that um, actively bringing about a patient's death is also a kind of perversion. Again, nothing sexual or gross, just going against uh, the purpose uh, of what we're working with. So in this case, going against the purpose of physicianship, which is all about healing. And euthanasia is basically the opposite of healing. So that's sort of like the big premise in Cass's argument that medicine is patient-centered patient and aimed at healing and is therefore uh, simply through this kind of role makes it wrong for doctors uh, to perform active euthanasia. I think another interesting point in Cass's argument is he says that it's a mistake to treat medicine as a technical craft. So when we think of something as technical, it's like, oh, it's just trying to find a technical solution um, to a mechanical problem. You know, being a mechanic is a technical job, right? The mechanic is trying to find ways uh, to make cars run, right? Uh, it's easy for doctors uh, to get into this mindset, right? What we're just trying to do is 
find a way to get a patient a few more years of life or find a way to uh, make a certain body part work like it used to. Um, and that's why we need better technology and sharper saws and uh, more precise computing power in order to achieve these goals. But the way that Cass thinks about it is that medicine is actually about how a doctor relates to a patient in making them whole again. Uh, so there's a technical aspect to it, but what's fundamentally at the heart of medicine that is not you know, at the heart of being a car mechanic is that you are working with and relating to uh, a person and not a thing. Um, and that he sees this lean in favor of euthanasia as a tendency to treat people like things. Um, and that euthanasia is basically saying, well, you know, this body just can't be uh, saved with the technology that we have, so let's, uh, let's throw in the towel. Uh, so that's, that's the thought here, and that's going to connect to some of the other issues we've been thinking about in this class already. That uh, Kant, for instance, said that we need to treat people as ends in themselves and not as mere means, which is basically a way of saying we need to treat people like people and not as things. So I think that there's a line of that same kind of thought uh, going on uh, in Cass's thinking. So uh, just to wrap up, let's uh, take a look, maybe from a more technical point of view, at a couple of Cass's arguments. Uh, so one kind of argument against euthanasia that we've already seen Cass hinting about is sometimes called a slippery slope argument. Uh, now, sometimes you'll hear people refer to a slippery slope as a fallacy, right? A fallacy is basically a bad but common uh, and sometimes uh, a very tempting form of argumentation uh, that should actually be avoided because it's uh, faulty and based on bad reasoning. That's what a fallacy is. Uh, so you'll hear about slippery slope fallacies, but a slippery slope argument is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's just an argument that says that we should not make a certain kind of change because if we bring about this change, something else terrible will happen. And that might actually be a good mode of reasoning in some cases. So, you know, you might think that uh, we're making a slippery slope argument when we say, if we do nothing to deal with climate change, a lot of human suffering is going to come about. A lot of human suffering is indeed going to come about because of this inaction. Uh, so therefore, we ought to do something about it. That's a slippery slope argument. And if you ask me, a pretty good one. Uh, some terrible things will happen if we don't do anything about climate change. So therefore, we better, right? Uh, but let's look at uh, an argument that we've already seen Cass making. He says that if legalizing active euthanasia would eventually lead to terrible abuse, then active euthanasia should be illegal. So remember, he points out that doctors might be tempted uh, to throw in the towel on difficult cases, or maybe uh, consent forms will be uh, manipulated in all sorts of terrible ways uh, if we allow active euthanasia. Uh, second premise, so this one's like an if-then kind of statement. If this would happen, then we shouldn't legalize euthanasia. And moreover, if we did, then it would, right? Legalizing active euthanasia would lead to terrible abuse, so therefore, active euthanasia should be illegal. So that's a logically valid argument, right? If premise one and premise two are true, then premise three is going to be true. So as we've already said, slippery slope arguments, again, are just to 
criticize certain social innovations on the grounds that allowing them will lead to terrible results in the long run. Uh, premise one seems like a pretty good argument, right? If we think that we're going to make the world a much more worse place uh, by enacting a certain law, we shouldn't enact that law, right? So really it's a question about whether legalizing active euthanasia would in fact lead to terrible results. And on that question, it's difficult to know whether premise two is true, right? We'd have to do some in-depth analysis about, say for instance, uh, what happens in countries like Holland uh, after active euthanasia is legalized. Uh, we might also start asking questions about whether things have gotten better or worse, say, in those West Coast states where physician-assisted dying is now legal. Let's look at another argument. This argument is really rooted in this sort of teleological argument remember, about the purpose of physicianship. So here's how this argument goes. It says that uh, active euthanasia is the intentional killing of an innocent person. So that's basically just true by definition, right? Um, active euthanasia definitely is intentional, and the person is presumably innocent it's not that this person uh, deserves to die or that we're trying to bring about their death uh, in order to give them what they deserve. So one, that's basically true by definition. Two, it is never morally permissible for doctors to intentionally kill their patients. So if you accept those two premises, then it's never morally permissible for doctors to perform active euthanasia. So I guess the issue here is that premise two might be debatable. You might find premise two really plausible because uh, you might be persuaded uh, by Cass's argument that the function of physicianship is healing. But there's an interesting question here. We might think that, well, maybe we should change the function of what it is to be a doctor. Maybe it should be healing, uh, but also easing suffering, or putting medical technique to use uh, to help uh, a patient achieve their goals. Uh, so maybe it's the case that there's more to physicianship than healing. Now, we'll look at Peter Singer uh, in our subsequent video um, to think more about that perspective. Uh, but there's another point that uh, Russ Schaefer Landau points out in your textbook that I think is worth reflecting on. It's that even if premise three is true, even if the conclusion is true, number three, uh, that it's never morally permissible for doctors to perform active euthanasia, we might also notice that it might still be permissible for someone other than a doctor to perform euthanasia, right? So the thought would be, well, why not just create some profession with the function of ending the lives of those who ask to have their lives ended? You know, just like we have additional um, professions uh, for specific kinds of doctors. Now you have anesthesiologists and radiologists with specific functions. We also have other medical professions that are not uh, physician positions, uh, but which, which have special functions. So midwives who have the special function of bringing about and helping uh, mothers uh, give birth uh, we might think, well, couldn't we sort of design a profession uh, designed to uh, hasten the death of people who ask for such a hastening? Uh, you know, a euthanasia nurse or something of that nature. 
so the point here is just that this argument uh, as a whole isn't an argument that uh, nobody should practice euthanasia, just that doctors shouldn't. So, uh, with all these things in mind, uh, I'll leave it to you to reflect on whether doctors should, from a moral point of view, ever uh, practice euthanasia. Would it lead to these terrible results in the long run? We might also ask whether it would pervert uh, the essential function of physicianship, as Cass suggests. So we'll leave it there, and next up we're going to be looking at an argument in favor of euthanasia in Peter Singer's uh, essay in your textbook, uh, Justifying Voluntary Euthanasia. So thanks for listening in so far, and uh, I'll look forward uh, to hearing all your thoughts about this interesting and complicated issue. All right. Thanks. Bye.